Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. BQ here, the most negative channel on the planet. We just so happen to talk about TNA here. And I got a mailbag episode for that ass. It is the 15th of July that I am recording this. And, I, you know, I like to try to do these once a month, if possible, especially during slow content times, like, like right now. If you want to get in on submitting questions for these in the future, Look up the Impact Lounge Engagement Group on Facebook. Now, I was told that some people are struggling to find the group. So I apologize because a couple of mailbag episodes ago, I kind of made fun of you guys. Like, uh, just look up the group on Facebook. Uh, but apparently, it's not popping up for some people. So in the pinned comment here, there will be a direct link. I said that last episode, and then I forgot to post the link. So this time, I absolutely will not. The questions are outdated. I need to fix them. You know, it's talking about we own the night. Um, talking about what else? Uh, if you subscribe to the Impact Lounge, you know, it's now negative BQ. Uh, the one question on there, though, it says who's the current digital media champion. That's the one I really pay attention to to see if someone's, you know, you don't have to be subscribed necessarily to the channel, but I need to know you're in the in the know of what's going on with TNA. So uh, that's the main question that I look for, but I do need to update those. So yeah, pin comment, check it, check it out. So I talked about this on my impact review. Let me get into this real quick. I will be out of the country on my honeymoon next week from the 21st to the 27th. This is a long awaited honeymoon from when I got married back in October. I will not be watching wrestling, talking about wrestling, reading about wrestling, anything like that, that week. So don't even, uh, don't be DMing me with that stuff, but uh, there will be no impact review that week. I don't even know that I'm going to watch the episode. I will probably listen to Mike Gilbert review it just to get up to speed, up to snuff, and then uh, go from there. But just don't expect any content next week. Nothing like that is going to go down. So this week's episode that comes out on the 18th, I will review that one before I uh, before I take off. And then uh, I don't remember if I talked about this on my impact review or not. Next month, August, looking like the 12th through the 31st, I'll be on active duty. So content will, may be a little wonky during that time because I work uh, overnights with my normal job and I only work four nights a week and it makes content a little bit easier. But when I'm on base, I work five days a week during the day. And the base is an hour, hour and a half away, depending on traffic. So it may be a slow content period during that time, but I'll at least get reviews out. So let's get into this mailbag. I got quite a bit of questions, so this might be a little bit of a longer episode. I try to rather, I you know, usually I do opinion pieces for these mailbags. Not that I'm some kind of expert on TNA. I'm not some expert on what's going on in the news, what's happened in the past. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's been brought to my attention, and I don't know why this was an oversight on my part. <laughs> but uh, on my review, I was talking about why aren't the Hardys wrestling for the titles of Slammiversary? Duh, Jeff Hardy can't leave the country. So um, I am no expert. I'm no expert. I've never worked in the industry. I've never worked for the company. I'm just a podcaster, and I'm a fan much like you guys. But usually these are opinion P. I did try to get some some scoops on some of this side some of this stuff and um ask direct questions so that I could get to the bottom of a few of these things. I had to preface of course with a lot of these questions I'm like, "Hey, for the record, I don't personally care. These are my uh my listeners who kind of want to know some of this stuff." Because if you're tuning into me right now for the first time as a podcaster, uh, I, I care so little about what goes on behind the scenes and I don't read wrestling sites. I, I like I seriously give two shits. What I care about is a good television show, good marketing, good social media, putting those things together and leading towards growth of the company. So when I see Slammiversary sells that at 4,000, um, I'm very excited about that. I'm about there, you know, when someone's like, oh, they got 200 or 300 people to tapings. Like, I don't care. Like, tell me it's sold out. Now, now I care. 
you know, you know what I'm saying? But I don't care about onesie twosie numbers and stuff. Normally I like to see tangible results as far as, Hey, the company is growing. Um, but I I'm really more focused on what I see on screen and what I see in social media rather than, you know, this executive backstage said this and they hired this guy. I just want a good product. I don't care the name of who they hire. I just want, I want the show to look good. You know what I'm saying? Um, my guy, Mike Gilbert is great with that shit. Wrestling Mark, like a motherfucker. He, um, he knows all these motherfuckers names backstage and what they do and where they came from and what they did and what Meltzer said and all that shit. So, you know, I always direct people to him if they want that kind of information. But for me, uh, I really approach things as a fan, as a critic. All right. So a lot of these questions were outside of my comfort zone to even ask, but I went ahead and did it anyway. I'm going to go ahead and read off names. I don't typically do that when I do mailbags. I just kind of read off the questions, but I think people like to hear their names. So that's how we're going to do it one time. All right, let's start off here. There's, there's no um, rhyme or reason or particular order that I'm doing this. I'm just doing it in the order that I am reading them in the engagement group. All right, Randy Adams, what up, man? Uh, do you see or have you heard of any talent possibly going to NXT after their initial deals are up, excluding Grace, who seems like a given? Um, no, I haven't heard of anything, and I wouldn't. I would assume that there's some people that have interest, but I, I can't think of anyone at the moment that I think some of the people who may not get a lot of screen time, if the opportunity is there, I think they would take it, but uh, I, I I don't think we have to worry about departures right now. Yeah. Jordan Grace is a given. Uh, Joe Hendry, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, Joe Hendry's out when his contract is up. I have no his contract is up. A, a lot of you guys probably do. Again, that's stuff that I really don't care about. You know, it's nice to know if someone tells me it's nice to know, but I, I don't dig into that kind of stuff. I don't, I'm not interested in it. Um, and I cannot get that information that it, those are not the kind of things I can ask someone. And they're like, Hey, you know, this is when it runs out. I don't think Joe Hendry is a given. I think there's a, a pretty high prob much higher probability that he sticks around than Jordan grace. Um, reason I say that is it's, it's entirely possible that we're going to look at Joe Hendry six from, months from now and say, this dude is a one trick pony. And this isn't like a shot at him. I, I like Joe Hendry. Everyone, he's very over with the people right now. But the reason I say that is because he's 50% over because of what he does on TV and 50% what he did off screen with this and his social media campaign. Because of that, because he did or organically get over, but didn't organically get over because of what he's doing on screen. There's a possibility. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there is a possibility that this does fizzle out. I hope not. This is the most over someone in, has been in TNA in a really long time. But, you know, I, when he, I listened to this promo he cut on Steve Macklin this past episode, I was like, you know what? He was better off not talking. Because if it gets to be where we hear from him every single time, it might get a little much. And... I thought his promo this past episode was a complete miss. And if we get too much of that, it's going to fizzle out in my opinion. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that he can't cover some of the songs the way he does on the indies. There's probably rights, you know, rights fees and stuff like that involved. Um, but yeah, he, he's, he's the one I, I, I fully expect Jordan Grace to be gone, but Joe Hendry, I think there is, I think it's like a 50, 50, I think there's a, a good possibility that he sticks around in TNA. Minor Lopez, my guy. With how things have been moving along after changes made by Anthem in personnel, can we expect more changes or upgrades for the company? We're going to get more changes. I promise you that. I don't know if it's going to happen this calendar year or not. It might happen after Bound for Glory, but we're going to get changes. You You will see them. 100%. Upgrades for the company. The cl the show clearly looks better right now. I think the backstage stuff looks still 
still could look a lot better. For me, it looks bad. For some of you guys, it might not. But the show, you know, cannot be ignored that it looks a lot better. The test is going to see be how these Impact Plus, excuse me, TNA Plus shows look and sound. Because those always seem to have snafus. So that's going to be the real test. But television looks a lot better. And um, I'll get in. Uh, oh, there's the dogs. I'll get into that a little bit deeper with one of the other questions later. Donald Hill, since Scott's out, do you think these dumb throwback shows and Wrestle House will go away? Do we think we can get them still taping after Bound for Glory this year? He's asking, after Bound for, for Glory, are we going to get original content? Well, we know that they they usually keep the TNA Plus shows going. They're doing the one in North Carolina with Wrestle, Wrestle Cade, maybe it's called. Uh, so that should be that should be a cool show. That might be the last time we see Jordan wrestle in a TNA ring. Um, this was the one question I did ask about, and I didn't get an answer. I, I just I just flat out didn't get an answer on it. Um, it wasn't responded to, so I don't know. I know the fan base has been asking for this. They do not like the we punch out after bound for glory strategy. And it's entirely possible it's a money thing. I don't think it, they're, they're like lazy. I don't think that's what it is. But, you know, it's it's probably a financial thing. But what happens is the company lose, loses so much momentum. And, you know, if it weren't for the TNA rebrand and talk about Will Ospreay and Okada coming to the Snake Eyes tapings and, and some actually some very good social media marketing they, they did in December, they would have went into hard to kill ice cold because last year they did. It was pretty cold going into hard to kill. So I don't know, but I know people are definitely asking for more original content, more of an effort. If it's a money thing, what can you do? But to punch out to basically, I say 80% punch out for the last quarter of the year is a little rough because bound for glory is supposed to be your biggest show. And you know, there's no fallout from it. So that's what kind of sucks. We got like the Mexico shows last year and Wrestle House. And oh, we didn't get Wrestle House, but we got IPWF. The first part of this question was about our IPWF. This was not a Scott Demore baby. This was an Artie Evans baby, I was told. So because he's gone, and you notice we're connecting this guy's name to a lot of the bad stuff on television, the Ash by Elegance stuff, IPWF, whatever the hell it's called. We're connect. We're starting to connect the dots to bad, to bad shit on TV. So it goes back to what I said. They got rid of people who were not, uh, who, where they were not happy with their performance. You know, they've they've said that that we have to find a way to course correct on Ash by Elegance a little bit. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. You know that I've made my personal opinion that I, I think she's going to be done after Slammiversary. That's just a personal opinion. No knowledge whatsoever i just kind of see the writing on the wall i guess but this was an rd evans thing so it is likely that we're not going to see ipwf again i know some of the fans like it that the marks definitely like it the tna marks um but so, you know, some of the fans do enjoy it and i don't think it's a bad concept it's just the majority of the fans don't like it that it, what the problem is I think the first one was so bad. I'm talking about the very first one was so fucking bad that people didn't really give it a chance again. They improved over the years, but overall it's a bad show. The, the way I always say it is the wrestlers are having more fun doing it than we are watching it. Because what I've always said on my podcast is you cannot make unfunny people funny. There's There's just nothing you can do. If you're not funny, if you don't have it, it's pretty difficult to create that humor. Monte Carlo with this NXTNA thing going on, what is in it for the actual TNA fans? It's great for the actual TNA wrestlers to be on WWE TV, but so far TNA fans have only received Charlie Dempsey and Tatum Paxi in return. Now remember, we also got No Quarter Catch Crew and um, Lizzie whatever. I don't remember, Lizzie Dane, something like that. Something along those lines. I'm not looking for a business perspective or Grace's perspective. <laughs> uh, 
Jordan Grace, man. She's like, let's do a TNA and WWE pay-per-view. I mean, straight up Mark booking, right? Um, but he's looking for the true TNA fan perspective. So I asked this question directly, and I, I got an answer saying TNA fans are impatient, including myself. So I, I got I to gotta dig in that one. Um, they are aware that they're not bringing the top TNA, excuse me, the top NXT talent. You know, the, I know it's the business answer, but the business answer is the exposure. What I got as the best fan answer to answer this question, because I know what you're asking. A lot of fans are asking. They're, they're trying to say, can we get someone we're actually excited about? That's, that's kind of where he's going with it. I remember when they had the partnership and someone said anyone less than Natty Nightheart is a disappointment. Prepare to be disappointed, buddy. We're going to get NXT people, NXT people we never heard of. They're like getting called down to TNA. You know what I'm saying? Like from the performance center down to TNA. I'm sure at some point we're going to get a decent name. But get, you know, be prepared. This is what we're getting. But what I got for the fan answer was that TNA is helping to, excuse me, WWE. They're like a big brother in this. They are helping TNA with how to produce live television. And with, with knowing how to do live television comes better sponsors and, and uh, things of that nature, better reaction. And, and, and the fans will be more into it if they can get live programming going. But WWE is working with TNA to help them produce good television. They're the standard, and that's who they want to learn from. They are acting as a big brother. I think they're trying to, you know, they're trying to uh, make up to the wrestling industry what Vince McMahon once, once took away from everyone. But I do think as well, because Tony Khan is known for, hey, you know, we're partnering with this person and this per this company and that company. And we're bringing over this person, and that person. This is WWE's version of the forbidden door. But they're doing it properly. And I think they want to show, hey, anything that AEW can do, we can do a lot better. You know, we have the capabilities of making it a lot better. They're getting more impressions and hits from partnering with TNA than AEW is with New Japan and AAA and CMLL, you understand? So it's still kind of a business answer, but fans are going to they're they're going to get a better product. They're visually going to get a better product. Saul Valentin, getting rid of Hanna <laughs> can getting rid of Hannafin and Raywall get you to enjoy TNA a little bit more? He's saying this in jest. They don't take away my enjoy, my ability to enjoy the show. I could do without Mal Raywall. I could. I've. I've said. I place and the, I mean in his place, and then Sam Laterna and GM Miller's place. That's what I would prefer personally. I'm kind of over a, over Matt Raywall just because I have from the beginning that I started podcasting. I've been I've been talking about this. I hate color commentators who switch between babyface and heel depending on the match. Don Callis did it. It drove me crazy. Corey Graves, when I watched NXT, did it. drove me crazy. JBL did it when I used to watch WWE and SmackDown. drove me crazy. Um, Jerry Lawler was able to kind of pull it off, but but not really. He really, he really started leaning a little bit more towards a baby face, but he had a little bit of heel in him. But when it came down to like protecting Jim Ross, he was there as a baby face. You know, Lawler's been the only one that's been able to even kind of pull it off. Everyone else just sounds ridiculous. But I do acknowledge that they do, for the most part, a very good job. It's a very big step up from Matt Stryker and D'Lo. Very, very huge step up from, from their latter years of Josh Matthews. And I... You know, looking back, Josh Matthews and the Pope were so much better than I gave him credit for at the time. Sometimes when I'm bored, I'll watch some pop TV episodes and um, some stuff from Destination America. And I'm like, man, the, the commentary was actually very good back then. 
but Josh Matthews has never been a popular guy. So we just kind of said, well, he sucks. But it, it really wasn't bad. Towards the end, it was awful. But we got very bad commentary for a long time. So I appreciate the way these guys stepped up. And, you know, he Tom really went over the fans when he showed up at, you know, his first show. I don't know if it was Slammiversary Rebellion. I don't recall. But he had all this knowledge on the company and the fans just ate it up and they loved it. So I appreciate that just like anybody else does. Their voices drive me crazy. I don't think he has a radio voice. I think he has someone pretending to have a radio voice. And just the, yeah, does it drive me nuts with the, I had a kick out? What the hell? Every 30 seconds? Yes, it does. But it doesn't really take away my ability to enjoy the show. I just can't listen. I can't watch the episode straight through. I have to take a break halfway through. And that's why I've said, you know, I can't watch that much wrestling at once. I'm referring to if I'm behind on episode, I can't watch like two episodes in a week. Tom's voice, I cannot. But I do, I do acknowledge what they do, and they don't, they don't take my way uh, away my ability to enjoy it. I just kind of like poking fun at uh, and I kick out and all that shit. Um, no, but I, I do wish he was a little more natural. For me, a good commentary. Uh, commentate broadcast team <laughs> is natural and they they really feel like they're in the moment like jim ross was he would react to stuff but it was very natural to where tom hannavan's very fake when he reacts at things so yeah could he be could he be a little more better and a little more better in that sense absolutely but no he does a good job pablo fernandez do you feel talent will still want to leave after some time since um, after some time has passed since Scott's departure? I don't. And I was I was at the forefront of the of the people saying, "Hey, wrestlers are going to leave the company now that Scott left." But now that I've learned that Scott is the fakest dude in TNA history and um, was very much overrated for his contributions to the company. And from what I understand, some of the wrestlers are now seeing that. That's not to say he wasn't liked backstage. He was. But I think he was very able, very much able to mask maybe how little he did in some areas and how much other people were doing in other areas. And he was, you know, he was allowing himself to, he was, I don't know if he was taking the credit, but he was allowing himself to have the perception that he was the one in charge of everything. And that causes issues backstage. I know Mike Gilbert can relate to me on this and, and maybe some of you as well, but this is a big problem in the military where the, the boots on the ground, the troops are the ones really doing the work. And the recognition always seems to go to, the commander to other high ranking individuals who are not involved. And, and in a lot of cases don't even know how to do the job that they're taking the credit for. I had a deployment one time in, in Kuwait. I was in charge of the vehicle fleet for two bases in Kuwait and one in Iraq. And then I was kind of like an alternate. in a, I guess you would call it a, an equipment custodian that had to get equipment and gear out to uh, various bases so um, it was myself and a partner, and and then we had other one other helper. I'll just put it like that. We busted our ass for six months, and at the end of the deployment, our supervisor is the one who gets the medal. And medals on a deployment are really important because you get points for promotion. You know, when you're trying to promote to your next rank, um, you gain points with your medals in the Air Force. So you get a lot of backstabbing, a lot of fucking people over. But it's such a, a morale killer for someone who just wasn't the one uh, coming up with the ideas to take the credit for it. So I'm not I'm not saying people dislike Scott because they did, but he just allowed the perception to be, and it may not have been on purpose, but he just allowed the perception to be that he was he was the one pulling all the strings, and that just wasn't the case. 
Uh, so I, I think I, I don't see anyone now outside of maybe Giselle Shaw saying, you know, nah, I'm out because Scott's not here. You notice the people who step up and talk about Scott are Deanna Peraza, who left. Uh, Will Ospreay, who was around for a little bit. Those are the people saying, Will Ospreay said Scott single-handedly revived TNA. That's not true. For someone like Deanna Perrazzo, she might feel the same way because she's gone. She, was, she wasn't there when he was relieved of his duties. But when I say that he allowed the perception to be that he took the credit, that was to the wrestlers as well, not just the fans in the wrestling world and the media. It was to the wrestlers as well. So um, I don't I don't see that happening. I don't, I don't think we're going to see departures. But again, I was I can admit I was the first one at the time to say, hey, the machine, the Motor City Machine Guns were the first domino, and you know Steve Macklin might be the next domino. Yeah, I was saying all that stuff. I was one of the first people saying, hey, people are going to leave. But now I've learned, you know, since then that you know Scott might have been a little bit of a snake, but definitely was not as um, not as impactful on the company as one would believe because he's been gone for how many months now and when the company's getting better right the show's getting better i mean can we you know creative is, is still a little bit stagnant but can we agree on that the show looks better it, it is better overall morale's high so scott clearly was not the head of this thing that we perceive that he was uh Big distribution deal, Gerard Ryan. Any update on the gut check winners coming in? So the girl, I don't know their names. I just know she's another girl that's probably going to have red red hair on this show. I think they're working out visa issues with her. I don't, I don't think we're going to see her this year. But I think probably top of the year, kind of like we saw Zaya Brookside and Ash show up. I think that would be a safe guess, but I don't think it's going to be this year, but they're working on that. As far as the dude, I'm sorry to disappoint you guys. There's a 99.9% chance we will never see him in TNA. Now, when he won this gut check thing, and I've never cared about gut check. To me, it's a fake contest. It hasn't produced anything because they don't, the people win the contest and then we don't see them or we don't see them enough. You know, it's never really give us, given us it, it is not tough enough. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're not like, hey, this person won and then they're taking us through the person's journey and then they try to make a star out of them. That That is not what this is. So a lot of people stopped caring. But this particular gut check, people were excited because this dude, I remember seeing some highlights. I feel like he was very Brian Cage-ish where he had a great look, great physique, uh, was was flying around and doing some cool shit. So everyone was really excited. I said on Twitter, I'll believe it when I see it, as far as these people showing up in the company. But the dude most likely is not going to be a part of TNA. I know a little bit more than that, but I can't repeat it. But most likely we're not going to see him. So just prepare that there's about a 0.01% chance that we're going to see him in TNA. John Peter Sam, how does WWE benefit from the crossover? If they wanted a ratings boost, why not? Just bring back The Undertaker or crossover with Raw and SmackDown. This isn't a ratings boost for TN, for NXT. This is doing their version of the Forbidden Better, and it's to freshen up their product. And really, to they, they are helping TNA here a little bit. They are they. I'm going to use the same terminology. They're being a big brother for TNA. They are helping. This isn't about ratings. If it is about ratings, they'll bring Cody Rhodes over and all that. That it's that's just not what it's about. They are they 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 place more of an emphasis on the fan than Vince McMahon did. You know that's it's just a different way of thinking. Colby Ryan Cooper, do you have a clearer understanding of who's in charge of the creative and booking in the company? Also, who's replacing replacing David Zahadi? So um, I'm going to answer that. But there's a couple other questions here that are very similar. Uh, Tommy Allenby said, maybe shed some light on creative. Why is it so bad? And the matches are just thrown together. It's literally nothing else. Uh, John Sharman, the hard cam was back on the entrance ramp again recently. Who keeps doing this? Why? Michael Murphy, does TNA need a creative team overhaul? Jana Robertson, any, I'm sorry, wrong one. 
Do you think they should replace most of the creative team? Things are so dull and repetitive. Fans are not real impressed with creative at the moment. Before I get to this question, I pointed this out on my impact review. I was talking about Josh Alexander, and when they decided he was going to be the standard bearer, as talented as he is in the ring, doesn't have a lot of charisma, is getting better with the promos. I think the content to his promos is always the same, which is part of the problem. But when they decided he was the dude, they had to go to a direction of wrestling and putting on a wrestling product and having good wrestling matches. To where before it was a, I always, the reason I've liked TNA is that it's a good balance of creative and the wrestling. Where WWE might try to put on too much of a show, you know, like for me, TNA was a nice balance. But when Josh became the guy, all of a sudden the show became about let's just have good wrestling matches and Mike Bailey, another guy, no charisma, but is amazing in the ring. So that's the direction they started going. And since then, it's kind of continued to be that way. Now we've gotten the AJ Francis is on screen. Um, Mustafa Ali. I'll even throw Ash by Elegance in there, but we're starting to get some some characters back on screen. Obviously, PCO, and they're all different characters in their own right. But we were, we were going a very bland direction for quite a bit, but for the most part, the fans are not real jazzed with the creative right now. I think the creative for Josh Alexander and Hammerstone was good. I think the creative that AJ Francis has been involved with since he's gotten to the company has been good. The creative that Mustafa Ali has been involved with has been good. I mean, he's carrying this entire storyline with Mike Bailey. Mike Bailey has, has provided nothing for it. This is the Mustafa Ali show, and he's making people care. He's very impactful, very powerful in the way that he does this. So it's not to say there's no bad storylines. That's not true. Are we lacking storylines? Yes. Are we still bumping into each other backstage to make to have to to create an excuse for a match? Yes. Are we interview interrupting interviews to create an escape? Uh, excuse me, I'm stumbling over myself. Are we interrupting interviews to create an excuse for match matches? Yes. Are we doing run-ins, post-match attack angles, disqualifications? Yes. People want to see something a little more creative than that. It's kind of what is it's boiling down to right now. As far as the question, do I have a clear understanding who's in charge of creative? What I was told is that these names are not... If they wanted these names out in the public, they'd be out in the public. They're not ready to release names yet of who's in charge of this and who's in charge of that. Same with who's replacing Dave Sahadi. All I know is that they did promote from within, which I've told you guys for years. That's typically what they do, which I haven't fully agreed with because I always feel like someone's doing a bad job. You get rid of them, replace them with the person underneath them. They're the ones learning how to do a bad job, so you're just going to continue. But in this case, <coughs> excuse me, in this case, uh, the personnel they've put in charge as far as how the the show looks, is a lot better. I don't know that it's actually the, the person that TNA put in charge, but Anthem is more hands-on with the television show right now. And that's the reason we are getting an increase in quality. People who, have, who know how to create television are helping create television. So that's, that's the big uh, upgrade, personnel-wise. But creative... They're not ready to put that information out yet. All I can tell you is that it is creative by committee. So they're working as a team. They agree with something. They run with it. I don't believe there's someone currently acting as the head. However, that is what I'm understanding. Tommy Allen B. Any more Bound for Glory news as far as the announcement and location? How it was communicated to me is that Things change. Locations, times, venues, the
the personnel that you deal with, those things change. And um, they're working on, you know, tying this down. I think we're going to get a announcement at Slammiversary. I know they were supposed to announce it a while back, and everyone had the date on their calendar circled, and all of a sudden the date came and went. And people were like, what's up with Bound for Glory? So there was just a lot that happened backstage, backstage, just behind the scenes, I mean, uh, regarding, the, again, the personnel they're talking to, times, dates, venues. There's just a lot of moving parts, which tells me it probably is overseas. I think they're talking about the UK. I think that was the rumor. It tells me if it's that difficult to book, then it probably is, but we'll see. For all I know, it's going to be the fucking palms. <laughs> Can you imagine the TNA fan base if, if they say it's at the palms? So, yeah, just uh, sit tight on that. Sal Valentin, again, if you were to pull a Russo and Bischoff, <laughs> I, like the, I like this already, and strip the titles off everyone, who would you put on top in each division? Would you bring back any titles, get rid of, or introduce any new ones? I wouldn't get rid of the Knockouts Tag Team Championships. I know a lot of people want them to go on, want them gone. I was one of the people that wanted them to begin with, so I'm not going to change my mind on that. Have they been handled well? No, 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 no. But there's potential there because there are women on the indies that you can use. It's not like the guys where it's like completely, Tony Khan completely dried up the indie scene. There's still a lot of very talented females out there. You can build a division. I've always said, make the knockouts tag team titles traveling titles and go to indies and you can make those digital exclusives. I'm going to... I'm not going to include the knockouts tag team titles in this because we don't have tag teams. So it would be kind of dumb to say, oh, I, I wish these people were the champion. I'm happy with Alicia being a champion with whoever her fucking partner is. I would love for them to bring back, you know, a TV title, Legends title, whatever they want to call it. I don't care, but a legit mid card title. And I would throw it on Steve Macklin. Legit, not the digital media championship. I would absolutely get rid of the digital media championship. I thought the, the biggest miss opportunity in of the year was the opportunity to get rid of that at the top of the year when they had new belts. And no, they could have done a TV title, but they said double down on the digital media bomb. And I, I think the majority of the fans did as well. AJ France is doing a good job with it, so I wouldn't change that if I kept the title, but I would 100% get rid of it if I had the ability. X Division, if I had to strip Ali, I would put it on... Um, God, what the hell is this? I can't remember this kid's name for anything, but the one who does the... Okay, let me look up the roster here real, real quick because this is driving me crazy. I never... Remember this kid's name? As I told you, I'm not in I'm not in the wrestling sites and all that shit like that. So these kind of things slip my mind very, very easily. Um going down, 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 down. I'll give me one second, one second, one second, one second. One second, one second. Leon Slater. Leon Slater. <laughs> I would put the belt on him. I think the world of that guy. The tag team champions. I like him on the system, but if I had to put him on anyone, I'd actually put him on Josh Alexander and Eric Young and like really legitimize that division. The world championship, I love it on Moose. If I had to put it on somebody else, I would put it on Mike Santana. And knockouts champion. If I could not put it on Jordan Grace, I would probably put it on Kylan King. So that's the answers to that. What else we got next? AK Infinity got back-to-back -back questions here. What are the key reasons that make the NXTNA engagement better than the Forbidden Door? Well, Forbidden Door is, it's every episode. Someone, someone's always showing up 
a lot of the wrestlers are very, man, I don't want to say irrelevant, but no one knows who they are. They're bringing these mass people from CMLL. No one has a clue. These wrestlers from Japan, no one has a clue. Well, the marks know, but the large majority of the audience doesn't know who they are. They're pulling people out of AAA. No one, no one knows these people. To where NXT handles it a lot like TNA has over the years, where it, it matters when they do it. They really pick and choose. They want it to be a they want it to be a name that's somewhat recognizable. And they want to introduce them in a way where people are talking about it. When someone from TNA shows up on NXT, the, the internet's talking about it. When someone shows up on AEW, no one's talking about it because it's the same shit all the time. And no one enjoys, I shouldn't say no one, but a lot of people don't enjoy what Tony Khan does because he puts his people over all the time. Majority of the time, I should say. Majority of the time he puts his people over. And obviously, you know, TNA's, I mean, excuse me, NXT's probably going to do the same. But you see the way they put over Jordan Grace when and, and the Rascals when they came out and Joe Hendry and, and treating them like huge stars. So... It's the presentation is totally different. They're not just bringing someone up from TNA every single week. I mean, like imagine you're just watching NXT and Big Con shows up or Laredo Kid, you know, Shira, someone that the NXT fan base doesn't really care to see. That's what AEW is doing. They're just bringing anybody. So the way TNA and NXT really as a team are handling it is perfection. It has people talking. It's creating chatter and social media buzz. And and when they do it, you can tell there's a storyline involved. Tony Khan does it, and it's just like, hey, let's have a good wrestling match. It came Finity also asked if Joe Hendry takes the belt for Moose at for Glory, who's the, t- the favorite to take it off Joe Hendry. I don't think Joe Hendry's winning the belt. I think they feel like Joe Hendry is over without it. And as I said at the top of the show, there's a there's a slight possibility that Joe Hendry is flavor of the month. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but the possibility is there. So it, it would be a real challenge to put the title on Joe Hendry because you really got a serious you got to make the gimmick a little more serious, but you can't lose its charm at the same time. That is, you know, if he starts being cheesy and he's the champion, I think people are going to turn on that. I don't think Joe Hendry is going to win it because there's nobody to take it off him to answer that question. There is not a heel unless Moose takes it right back off him at Bound for Glory, which is entirely possible because they're doing rematches now. At pay-per-views, it is entirely possible that they say, okay, we're going to give Joe Hendry his feel-good moment. I think him winning it in this six-way would be a huge disservice. I don't think anyone, I don't think a title should change when there's that many people involved. So if it happens and they give us a feel-good moment, I think Moose will take it right back at Bound for Glory. I'm just looking at the roster here. There's nobody. There's, I, I'm going to scroll down here a little bit from a, you know, heel wise, you know, AJ France is not going to take it off him. It's not going to be Allen Angels. It's not going to be Campaign Singh, Brian Myers. It's not going to be Eddie Edwards. Maybe Frankie Kazarian. You know what? They have an angle going, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that name into the pot. If Joe Hendry wins the title, then. The favorite would be Frankie Gazarian to take it off him. TW, my guy. What can TNA do to cultivate a more exciting feeling for their TV show similar to what we see in NXT? That's a great question, and I don't know that I have the answer. Because when you watch NXT, yes, the fans are into it. It's not genuine, though. There's something I would love to sit in an NXT crowd one day and hear what they're told. It's like when you watch women of wrestling. There's no, there ain't a more hype crowd than women of wrestling. 
but there's nothing genuine to it whatsoever. They show that the the fan reactions, the stuff that happens on on NXT, and it is so fucking phony. But they're into it, and you hear them, and they're nice and loud. I don't know how to get a lot of TNA fans off their hands, but I will say, because I've said this for many years, is that there's a disconnect between the show and the audience because they don't know what they're watching. They don't know the storylines because all the storylines seem to to happen backstage. The only thing they know about storylines is is half the matches have sneak attacks and and run-ins and... uh, you know what I'm saying? Post-match attack angles. So then you have an idea. Okay, well, these t- these people are feuding, but you don't really know the stories to anything because it happens backstage. So there is there is a big disconnect. You're not watching on the Big Tron, the interviews backstage. You have no clue what's going on. If you were watching, say, for instance, you don't watch the television show and you saw Zaya Brookside and Steph Delander wrestle each other and then... Steph Delander makes her return a month later, and Zaya Brookside's her best friend. Like, what the fuck is going on? But we've gotten some context on that with backstage angles and interviews. That ever since Steph Delander is in love or pretends to be, Zaya Brookside is, you know, is down, down for the cause. But there, there is a big time disconnect. If you are there in person, you're just seeing a bunch of wrestling matches. A lot of the times, they're doing a better job of this. But when Penzer was around, Penzer wasn't saying this match is for the number one contendership for the X Division Championship. And I use this example. This past episode, when Jade says the the following is a wild card challenge, what the fuck does that mean to the people in the audience? They have no clue what's going on. So there is a disconnect. I don't know if there's a way to fix it. Because it's not live television and they're taping. There's something missing between the product and the people in the crowd. So where they're just reacting like they're watching an indie show. So I think that's where part of the problem lies. I don't know how to fix it. I don't have an idea. I really don't. We have anything else here? Uh, last one. Jana Robertson is asking any prog- progress in acquiring more knockouts. I don't know this. I didn't get a chance to answer to ask this question when I saw it. Um, I, I all I can say is that I think we're getting the new girl top of the year, and my gut is still that there's going to be no Ash by Elegance come bound for glory. And options out there i truly feel when jordan grace is gone that the probability of tessa blanchard coming in is high i feel that i think a lot of people feel that a lot of people don't want her but i think the 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 there's a probability a very fairly high probability that they would bring her in to replace jordan because jordan's irreplaceable I, i saw someone in the engagement group saying jordan grace would not be a big loss like i disagree more she's a huge loss i think she's going to go down as the best knockout in the history i I like diana perrazzo better as a champion because you got invested in diana prado perrazzo winning and losing winning or losing and who is going to take the belt off her so where jordan wrestles you just know she's going to win she's in matches that you know what the outcome is ahead of time so i think diana was a better champion but jordan's going to go go down as the best knockout ever. So you you can't replace that. The person closest to being able to replace her is Tessa Blanchard. So I do think by Bound for for Glory, we're going to get someone. I just don't know who. But I have to believe they're bringing knockouts in. Have to. But they might decide, hey, we're going to hitch the wagon to Kylan King when, when she comes off injury. You know, who knows? But... They definitely need um, some new warm bodies because the the division is so ice cold. This is the worst I've ever seen since I've been a fan. There's been a couple of low points. This is bad. This is very, very bad right now. 
but there, there's there's women out there. You know, Stephanie Vacker, like heading over to WWE, and you know, it's like you see she goes to AEW to do the match with Mercedes Monet, and then WWE signs her real quick. It's like, man, this and I, I've been familiar with her. Just because I think I saw a picture of her once, and I thought she was so sexy that I was like, "Let me follow this woman's career." So I've been following her for a while, and seeing her wrestle, and I knew she was good. But it's like, man, someone of that caliber and that talent was just out there, and no one snatched her up. There is, there are women out there, and I bring it up all the time. NWA has no problem with a women's division. Doesn't matter who leaves, they have no problem fielding a tag team division. So TNA has to step up here big time. Top of the year, we talked about this division looks really bleak. And here we are in July, midway through July, over halfway through the year. And there's not been a single knockout added to the roster. That's absolutely bananas when you think about it. That is going to do it for me. That is all the uh, the questions. TW sent me a couple silly ones. Deadpool or Wolverine. I'll go with Deadpool. What's the other silly one he asked me? Tacos or fajitas? Tacos. And that's it. Um, but Michael Murphy, I, I brought this up earlier when he said his TNA needed a creative team overhaul. They don't. They probably could add some creative minds to it. But I don't. I wouldn't say at this point we just got to overhaul it because it's just that the the mindset is wrestling. Race. You change the mindset, you don't necessarily have to change the personnel. And then uh, when John Charman was asking about the the hard cam, that that's always that's always the venue. But I know they're going to shoot better venues next year, so hopefully we stop getting that because enjoys that. That's going to do it for me, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the TNA Mailbag. I'm your boy BQ. And I am out. Peace.